All right, we are rolling. Welcome to the podcast, guys. We got a real treat for you guys today. I had him on the podcast, uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago. You might know him as the fit to fat the fit dude. Mr. Drew Manning's been on Jay Leno, Dr. Oz just recently uh, in Men's Health Magazine. has had uh, uh, books he's written. He'll have to talk more about those. And then has also had a reality show uh, doing what he essentially did to uh, grow his brand in the first place. Drew, what's up, man? Travis, always a pleasure to be on the podcast, man. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, um, I look up to you, man. You're such, you're you're a huge role model, and uh, I just thank you so much for uh, yeah, just being a positive influence in the industry. And um, you know, I come from the personal training background as well, and I love everything that you talk about. You know, and that was my message years ago: is like, hey guys, this is more than just a body thing. Yeah. You know, because when I first got into it, it was all about the body. And I felt like over time, you know, after I went through that mental transformation, I felt like I was building monsters and clients only making it about your body. So I love that you talk about that and everything. But uh, for those who don't know you, and if they don't know you, they've probably been living underneath a rock. Tell tell everyone a little bit uh, what I missed. Yeah. So you kind of mentioned it, the fit to fat to fit dude or the fit to fat to fit guy. That's where no, most people know me from is my experiment that I did back in 2011. Um, that was the first journey where I intentionally gained weight. I put on 75 pounds during that experiment and I, I intentionally gained weight for six months. So I stopped exercising, ate a lot of highly processed food that we have here in America, like cinnamon toast crunch and Mountain Dew, mm. <laughs> uh, lots of processed food to put on that weight. Uh, and that, that journey, that experiment I did went viral online. Like I or, organically it happened. I didn't you know, know what I was doing at the time. I kind of just winged it and got very, very lucky to have that experiment go viral where it landed me on shows like the first show I do, I, the first show I did was Jay Leno um, and then Dr. Oz and Good Morning America, The View, um, you know, wrote a book about uh, my experiment, which became a New York Times bestseller, um, ended up losing the weight, but I learned so many valuable lessons from that first experiment. It really shifted in how I helped clients. Like I really shifted my perception of what transformation is about. Mm -hmm. and um, been making a name for myself ever since 2011. And then again, I did the journey in 2020, a second time around, which I know we talked about on the last podcast, mm -hmm. to, uh, to do it again as a 40 year old. And so I've done that experiment twice now. And uh, yeah, I had two seasons of my TV show that you mentioned, where we put other trainers through that process, and in hopes to shift the industry and change the industry. And it's cool that you mentioned that you were kind of preaching this, you know, back in the day, I feel like it's hopefully starting to make some change, some headway in the health and fitness industry, where it's not just focused on the physical body, but more so the mental, emotional, even spiritual side mm -hmm. uh, is kind of like blending into that health and fitness industry, which is really cool to see. Yeah, it, it keeps getting bigger. I, I called it the um, back in the day before I really built our brand, which is the next gen agency, you know, I call it, this is the next generation of transformation. It's, it's mind, it's body. And it's, I call it spirit. Some people refer it to a soul, but, uh, yeah, I think those three things are the most important. And, um, so yeah, I love that you do that. And there was a method to the madness that I, that I didn't know when I first met you, but the first time you gained all the weight, you were like, I'm going to follow the, the typical, uh, American food pyramid. Yeah. And I thought that was so genius because if you do any kind of research, you'll find out real fast that that's bullshit. But I, I really love that. And then the second time, uh, tell us your, the, the method you did the second time. Yeah. So the second time I wanted to include probably the four most popular diets here in the U S and that would be keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian. Um, you know, most people have heard of those four diets. I really wanted to do a spin on that where I showed people the unhealthy versions of those diets and the way that most people tend to do these diets in an unhealthy way. So I really wanted to highlight what not to do if you do one of those four diets mm -hmm. um, to show how unhealthy they can be. Just because you're doing a certain diet doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be healthier for you. And so I did uh, uh, some mini experiments within the experiment to show people like, hey, if you're going to do keto, paleo, vegan, or vegetarian, Here's what not to do. And here's what a lot of people end up doing, because what I showed Travis was that people tend to gravitate towards the convenience, 
comfort foods that exist here in America. So the pizzas, the French fries, the waffles, the pancakes, the ice cream, the cookies, the desserts, like all the foods that we have here in, in America that are comfort foods. And then we create foods that fit into these categories of these diets, like keto, paleo, vegan, vegetarian. And so people think, hey, I'm eating this keto pizza and eating this keto ice, ice cream and I'm keto. I should be healthier. I should be losing weight. Um, and that and people end up gaining weight or becoming unhealthier because they think that they're doing these diets the right way. And so I show people in the first half what not to do. And then in the second half, I revisited those, those diets and showed people like, look, if you're gonna do these diets, here's the correct way to do them. So I wanted to give people a roadmap or some guidance into what not to do and then what to do. And it's interesting that I gained weight on all of those, but also I did my blood work before and after. Mm -hmm. And it was crazy how, for example, my triglycerides, skyrocketed when I did dirty vegan and dirty vegetarian because people think those diets are automatically you know uh, healthier but man your triglycerides when it was in the 400s for dirty vegan and over 500 for the dirty vegetarian diet that stuff's scary you know and a lot of people I think it woke a lot of people up to just how unhealthy some of these diets can be if you're not doing them the right way yeah <laughs> that would scare the yeah. shit out of me to see that number on my blood work <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. For so, those who are, for yeah. those who are listening to get your blood work checked. I believe you should get checked multiple times during the year. It's amazing how many people haven't got their blood checked in years. True. It's going to, it's going to be one of your first signs for um, any type of, you know, disease and just figuring stuff out. So get your blood shirt blood checked often. Anyways, I want to talk a little bit about your men's health magazine. We were talking a little bit this off, off the air. Um, what, what did the author refer to you as on the hey, magazine? The world's most influential stunt dieter. <laughs> stunt dieter. <laughs> and so you like, said, and you said you didn't necessarily like those words. Yeah. I'm not like, you know, here's the thing. I know how the industry works. Like I know how it is like for men's health. Like nowadays it's gotta be a click baby type of title for people to even click on it. So that kind of title is going to get people interested or it's going to be controversial. So I get what he's trying to do, get people to click on this. What is this guy doing? He's the most influential stunt dieter. What does that even mean? Mm -hmm. And then, and then people will start reading the article. So if I had the choice of words, I wouldn't have used those words. I probably would have, you know, done something like uh, self experimenter, you know, versus stunt dieter. Mm -hmm. but it's out of my control. What sure. he wrote in the article was based off of interviews, multiple interviews over the course of about six months. He interviewed me, you know, every few weeks for, you know, a few months to really gain a better understanding of who I was. And then okay. he took all that information and wrote it down and summarized it into an article. So there's going to be things that are taken out of context. Sure. going to be things that are definitely controversial or maybe twisted in a weird way. There are some things in there that I'm like, I didn't like his choice of words here or there. Mm -hmm. But like they say, any news is, is good news, right? <laughs> yeah. As, as Grant Cardone would say, it don't matter if people hate you or like you. It's all that they know is they know you, man. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's interesting. So how did you land that? How did you land getting on that cover? He saw me, the, the editor, he works for a bunch of, um, um, you know, uh, companies like Men's Health. He writes for a bunch of different uh, companies and he saw my experiment and reached out. I think that's how it happened. So this is why I did it a second time, Travis, because back in 2011, not a lot of people saw it as it happened. A lot of people heard about it after the fact, mm -hmm. because back in those days, there was no live streaming. There was no TikTok. There's no Insta stories. Mm -hmm. So people can see the daily updates that I was doing yeah. uh, back in 2011. This time around, when I promoted it and marketed it, people could check in with me every single day and be like, oh, what's Drew eating today? Or what did he weigh in at today? Or what, you know, what's his blood work like? Or what, where's his measurements? Like they wanted to see, it was like a train wreck, right? Yeah. And I think that's how it got the attention. And then people like him reached out to me, said, hey, I want to write an article about you. And I'm like, okay. So I didn't know it was actually going to come to fruition. Here we are, what, almost a year later that it finally got published. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. I, Cause yeah, it has been a while. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, we're having Drew come speak at our mastermind in Las Vegas. It's our high level mastermind for uh, six and seven uh, figure earners. What are what are you going to be talking about? We haven't we haven't really talked about this. I just I know you personally. I'm like I'm sure he has gold to share. Whatever he's going to share. But what what's some of your message 
messages to the the business owners that have broken the six multiple six and into the seven figures yeah for me the biggest thing that i focus on is learning how to shift your perception and the power of shifting your perception and what that means whether you're someone that's trying to lose weight or whether you're a business owner trying to you know grow your business shifting your perception of what success looks like no matter what industry is super powerful and super important so what i do is i, I share a lot of my story and what i went through what I learned from it. And then I go over techniques and tools that I've used to help shift my perception, but also help my clients shift their perception of what success looks like or what happiness looks like within the industry that you're trying to grow in, right? And I think all of us are trying to grow in some way, shape or form, whether it's in a physical fitness type of way or mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially with your business um, and, and learning how to shift your perception is huge. It's a huge, a powerful tool to be able to find a place of, of fulfillment. Um, you know, like I said, no matter what industry you're in. And so learning those techniques and tools of how to do that, because it requires a, a rewiring of your brain. And that's something that seems really, really out there for people, but it's something that's possible that you can learn how to do. And if you could rewire your brain, you could change your perception of what you see and how you see it. And then your, you know, your, your happiness, or your level of success is not dependent on the things that you once thought it was like a lot of people think oh i will be successful when x y and z happen or i will be successful when i lose the weight and the guy get fit and a lot of us put our focus on the end result as that form of happiness or level of achievement mm -hmm. and um, what i'm trying to do is help people shift the perception of learning how to be happy now and mm -hmm. fulfilled now while you're continuing to work on a better version of yourself and a perfect segue into this is the book atomic habits james clear talks a lot about learning to fall in love with the process instead of falling in love with the product people want the product mm -hmm. they put up with the process right they put up with the process until that process becomes too uncomfortable or too difficult for them and uh, and then they end up quitting because they didn't reach the, their results their desired results and they think they're a failure so uh, a lot of the stuff i'm going to be talking about is learning how to do just that uh, from a physical perspective, but also mentally and emotionally and some tips, tricks and hacks in all of those arenas and how to apply them in your life to really honestly like gain fulfillment. I think that's really what we're searching for is learning how to be happy, fulfilled now, instead of saying one day I'll be happy and fulfilled when X, Y, and Z happens. And so I'm um, really excited to be able to share my story and talk about just how to do that because that's worked for me in my life, not just like with my body and getting fit, but so many things, you know, uh, letting go of the past, healing traumas or uh, psychological challenges that have been keeping us back, becoming more aware of what those challenges are and learning how to be more in control of your life instead of just being reactive. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, these kinds of things apply to, you know, like I said, people that are just trying to lose weight, but people that are trying to grow their business as well. Mm -hmm. No, I love this, man. This is, this is awesome. And I think people think success is a destination and they also think failure is a destination as well. And yeah. it's, it's all fluid. Yeah. And, um, you know, when I was younger, um, you know, first starting in the industry, obviously when you're starting your own business, you all, I think it's default that you have your eyes on a, on a prize, right. Of a certain money you want to bring in each year. What was your first like big goal that you wanted to achieve in your business when you first started? That's a good question. Uh, when I first did fit to fat fit, honestly, because I didn't know how to dream big at the time. I was like, Oh, if I get on the local news here in Utah, like Fox 13, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I remember, I remember you saying that <laughs> I was like, I've made it, you know? Um, yeah. and, then, and I said the same thing. I've been on the news, man. I'm, I'm big now. I always said I would, make the news not watch the news and i'm on it so yeah I, I get that yeah and that was like my first big thing and then boom before you know it, i was on jay leno and i was like damn i'm on jay leno this is insane like i didn't think i would ever be on like a national tv show meeting celebrities like That's chelsea incredible. handler and then mm -hmm. jay leno of course and some other cool people and then from there once you have these other wins i feel like the sky's the limit then you start believing in yourself and you're like oh i actually can do these impossible things i think a lot of people their self-limiting beliefs hold them back from actually achieving the things that they think it, you know aren't meant for them. And that's another rewiring of your brain or shifting your perception of, of being able to get outside of those self-limiting beliefs and realize that, dude, you can aim for the stars and you can achieve that. Um, it's just learning how to shift your perception of that specific thing. 
And, uh, and I, like I said, I've done it, you've done it. A lot of people have done it. It's just learning how to do it um, on something on a tangible level. That is something that can be applied into your daily life. And I feel like those things can be achieved. But the cool thing is that now, now that you learn these techniques, your happiness isn't dependent on that happening. It's awesome if it does happen and manifesting it is great, but your happiness is not dependent on the outcome of that result. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When, when I was in my training days, I worked with a lot of really successful people in business. And um, at times I was like, man, I feel like I should be paying you for this session, (laughs) not vice versa. Um, But I, I had a lot to offer them too. My value wasn't business at that time. My value was, Hey, here's what we can do with your body. Here's how we can be more productive during the day. Here's how we can eat. And I would look at, and, and some of them were unhappy when I first met them. And it really blew my mind. I was like, you have the cars, you have the house, you, you have everything. How are you possibly unhappy? Yeah. And it's because I thought the same thing that you were saying, I thought success was a destination. Yeah. And there's this book, I don't know if you've heard of it. It's called The Second Mountain. Have you ever heard of that book? No, I haven't. It sounds awesome. Anyways, it, it just talks about like, hey, you know, you've achieved the first mountain, but if you're not trying to climb the second mountain, you're going to find yourself, you know, unhappy. And so what I've come to find out, you know, because I went through some of those funks too, is making it, it wasn't about the money. The money was just the byproduct, the trophy of playing the actual game. Yeah. Kind of like Tom Brady. Tom Brady, you know, he obviously loves the trophy, but it's not the trophy that he plays for. He plays because he actually loves the game. And I think going to the next level for me, it's how can I play the game differently? How can I impact more lives? How can I do cooler things? And so that's what it's been for, for me. So I really think this will be a good conversation to have at the event. Yeah, man, I'm really excited. I'm grateful that you invited me. There's going to be a lot of great speakers there. Um, I haven't been to Vegas in a while either. I think it's going to be really, really cool. And I think you guys put together a, a great lineup of speakers that deliver a lot of value to people. So like I said, I'm just grateful to be included in that list. And yeah, excited. you you were one of the first people we've thought of. We had Keaton Hoskins last year. He freaking blew up the house. He was amazing. And we've had, you know, not to demean any speakers of the past, they were great. We've just haven't had this explosive, explosive of a lineup in years. You know, um, our goal in, um, with our events is we want to create the best business experiences in the world, not just all about information, like an experience where people can be inspired, learn from each other, grow from each other, but also, um, leave knowing that, Hey, I have some more things I can apply to my business to go to the next level. So super excited to have you, um, real quick before we wrap up, wrap up the show, um, Mm -hmm. and talk more about that event for people who want to uh, do it this month. I've been talking a little bit about sales philosophy and sales strategy. Mm -hmm. What do you think's the number one thing that, um, what, what do you think's the number one mindset that holds people back from going to the next level of their sales and their business? It's a good question. I think if you ask a hundred people, you're going to get a hundred different answers. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to hear from, yeah. from, from you. And, and that's why, that's why we're doing the theme of the month is because I want to hear, um, you know, what the Titans and in dis- different industries are saying. I think a lot of it has to do with knowing your audience first and foremost. And then the second thing that I would say, because it, it applies to my business is vulnerability and authenticity. And what that does learning how to be vulnerable with your audience and being authentic with your audience builds this relationship of trust. And if you don't have that relationship of trust, if you don't have that relatability, it's really hard to get people to buy your stuff. You can gain followers, right? You can gain lots of followers by posting booty pictures or like sexy pictures, right? You can get lots of people following you, but if you want people to truly listen to your message and, and, and buy what you're trying to sell, I think, uh, you know, that relatability factor is very overlooked and a lot of people don't know how to be vulnerable and they don't know how to be authentic because they're afraid of what other people think, or they're afraid of what other people are going to think about their brand if they are vulnerable or if they are authentic. How did you get past that? How did you get past the, um, what other yeah. people would think about you? And because a, a lot of, because a lot of people, we, we say that we say, Hey, you need to be vulnerable or you need to be authentic. But then when it comes to being vulnerable and authentic online or with a customer, I think a lot of people hold back. Why do you think that is? Really good question. I think it comes down to self-awareness. Awareness is something that comes slowly uh, over time, but it also comes during specific moments where we realize something, we have an epiphany, 
we increase our level of awareness. And then from there, maybe we get a little bit closer to be having courageous to make that decision to be vulnerable, right? So for me, what that looks like was reading books like by Brene Brown. Her books have really, really helped me uh, lean into vulnerability as a strength. And it wasn't just like one day I was like, I'm going to be vulnerable today or I'm going to be authentic. Yeah, it was taking all those experiences from reading those books, meditating on them, talking to my therapist about them, take, talking to my life coach. And then from there, you know, making small decisions, whether it's like, hey, I'm going to do a post about this and kind of see how it goes and see how people respond. And then for me, the thing that really, you know, made that, that, I, that I made that leap of faith on was when I opened up and talked about my divorce, which I thought my life was over. I was like, dude, this, I'm done. Like no one's going to buy my stuff anymore. You know, all those fears, um, you know, self-limiting beliefs that we talked about earlier in the podcast really kept me from making that decision until I took all those experiences from the past of reading those books. And like I said, meditating and all those epiphanies that have come to me and then actually applying it and doing it and then seeing what the reaction was, you know, we suffer a thousand times more in our head than we do in reality. So I was suffering in my head of like, what if this person says this? And what if that person says that? And what if like, you're worrying about all these things versus just going out and doing it. And just, and just, then from there, uh, learning to disconnect from the reaction of people, because people are going to be negative, people are going to be positive, you can't control that. And this is what doing the work for me has helped me overcome that was 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 letting go of the attachment to the responses. Um, so it's, it's, like I said, it's something that has come over time, the list of things that I would say that really helped me were reading the books, meditation, therapy, uh, a life coach, journaling, or reflection of some type. Uh, listening to podcasts as well really helped rewire my brain, shift my perception of, of being vulnerable and what that needed to look like, and, and then not being attached to the outcome. Those are the things that I, I, I've worked on to get to that point of, like you said, how do you, like, how do you embrace vulnerability as a strength? It, it, we think it's just like a split decision, like, okay, I'm going to be vulnerable today. Yeah. It's a lifetime mm -hmm. of experiences that have so led me true. to that point of actually making that leap of faith and like, you know, Tom Brady talks about this as well, but the man in the arena uh, is, is <clears throat> um, it's not about the, what the critic, the critics don't count. The people in the stands, like they don't count. They're not the ones who are putting their blood, sweat and tears fighting in the arena. It's the person in the arena who, who, who counts, not the critics. And yeah. so I love that quote by, I think it's a Teddy Roosevelt quote, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's amazing documentary. You guys need to definitely go watch that. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things I always talk about with, um, you know, people that come on our agency, you know, I talk about the four next gen laws of success. And um, the second one is, you know, never quit, right, which is very cliche. But I said, there's a deeper quote to that is you can't let failure get to your heart and you can't let success get to your head. Love that. And when you allow one, you're by default allowing the other because you're seeking outside of you for that. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I totally agree with everything that you said. And for me, you know, it's do I have I come to peace with what happened? Have I appreciated what happened? Um, and have I accepted it? And if I if those three things are met then I feel like I can get that out to the world. And there's some things that I'm still coming to peace and appreciation into acceptance to. And so how do you, and, and I guess this is a question that, you know, I've always thought about and I have my own answer. Um, how do you know when to, what to be vulnerable, vulnerable about and what to be authentic about? How do you know, like really what to share in your life? Cause there's aspects of your life that you don't want broadcasted, you know, all across the, the internet. So how do you know that line? I think for me, what it's come down to is in my, the question, there's a couple of questions you got to ask yourself. Am I sharing this from a place of pain or am I sharing this from a place of healing? So that's gotcha. the first thing is like, am I just sharing my pain with other people? That's called oversharing, right? There's a difference between oversharing and being vulnerable. And Brene mm -hmm. Brown, really, if you want to go deeper into this, read her work uh, to, to know the difference between oversharing and being vulnerable. Um, you know, is it coming from a place of healing or is it coming from a place of pain? If it's coming from a place of pain and there's still pain there, probably not the best idea to share it publicly or, or share mm -hmm. from a, a, you know, in a public setting. The second thing is, do I have the exact steps and tools to help people go from pain to healing. Mm -hmm. So for me, like having those actionable steps 
uh, instead of just sharing what I went through and what, you know, what it, it, it the pain it caused me the, on the back end is like, okay, and here's how I overcame that. Here's the actionable steps I took that you can take too, if you've been in this similar situation. So it's, it's coming, uh, it's, it's a way of paying it forward. If you come from a place of healing versus coming from a place of still stuck in that pain, I think people are going to be able to uh, pick up on that as you share your message too. And yeah, that's something yeah. that I have to really sit down with and meditate. It took me almost a year to, to do my podcast, just FYI, because going back and forth in my head, talking to people like, what about this? What about that? And talking to my therapist, my life coach, like, you know, and then finally you know, coming to peace with like, I think I'm ready to share this now. Cause I know what I want to say. And I know how to help people through this, like coming from a place of like, I want to help people through this. Here's what I did. Here's what I learned from it. And then here's the steps I took to overcome that. Then it was, I was ready to share it with the world. Yeah. I love that, man. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. I'm excited to see you in about a month now. It's yeah. going down uh, April 17th through the 21st. Um, if you'd like to check out the event, it's nextgenmastermind.com. Okay. You can reach out to me personally if you would like a discount code to come. Again, nextgenmastermind.com. I'm excited for you to come, man. You're going to meet uh, amazing people. I'm excited to hear you speak as well. Thanks for coming on the podcast. How can people uh, follow you? Yeah, super simple. Just at fit to fat to fit. That's with the number two in between. So fit number two, fat number two fit. Uh, it's all the same for all social media handles and my website. Okay. Love it, man. Hey, see you in Vegas, brother. Yeah, we'll see you soon. Thanks for joining, guys. If you feel like this podcast can really benefit someone, please share the podcast. Give me a five-star rating. I'd really appreciate that. Okay, we'll see you next time. Be inspired in what you're doing, guys. Be next gen. And as always, the world needs you. Good talk. Amen.